and welcome to another edition of Around the Coin, one of the premier fintech podcasts out on the interwebs today. My name is Faisal Khan and I'm here with my co-host Nako Mbele. My guest today holds a PhD in economics from Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, better known as RMIT University in Australia. His thesis was titled Safety and Soundness, an Economic History of Prudential Banking Regulation in Australia, 1893 to 2008 and offered the first comprehensive history of the politics and economics of prudential banking regulations in Australia. Fair to say, my guest knows his financial regulations well. Dr. Chris Berg is one of Australia's most prominent voices for free market and individual liberty and a leading authority on over-regulation, economic freedom and civil liberties. Our talk today with him will be around crypto economics. Around the Coin is made possible with support from our partners. Transfer-2.com, operating a cross-border mobile money network for emerging markets, processing airtime top-up, money transfers, mass payouts, and merchant payments in real time. For duly licensed financial institutions, organizations, and merchants, that's transfer-2.com. Bank Next is delighted to be associated with Around the Coin for strong opinions about payments industry. Go to banknext.com. That's B A N K N X T.com. And now with Nako Mbele, Dr. Chris Berg. Hey, Chris, how are you? Really well. Thank you for having me. Okay, great. So, just uh, for everyone to know, who are you? What do you do? And how did you end up here? Sure. Um, I'm with uh, RMIT uh, University. We've started up a what we're calling the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub. The universities um, realized, I think quite rightly, that um, blockchain is a very exciting new technology and it's very exciting new technology for economists particularly. So they've done, um, uh, they've put in quite a bit of support um, uh, for for the project. My background though is um, in sort of politics. I, I worked for 12 years for a free market think tank here in Melbourne, Australia, um, doing political economy work. Then I went to get my PhD, which is actually, which was in the regulation of banking in Australia. Um, and I'm trying to, and hopefully will apply some of that political economy story to to, to the, the big issues in, in cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Very good, very good. So the first question, what is crypto economics? Explain that to us. Crypto economics is uh, the economic study of blockchain technology, and there's there's sort of two sorts of crypto economics. I think it's a, obviously it's a very developing new field. People have only started to talk about crypto economics as an actual field over the last you know two years at the most. The first sort of crypto economics is um, the crypto economics of how blockchains actually function, their internal functions. What is the mechanism by which they, for instance, maintain a proof of work or proof of stake system? Um, that's very uh, focused on what you would call mechanism design. It's very much focused in game theory. And it's where a lot of businesses, particularly and um, entrepreneurs, are interested in seeing the economics of blockchain work, because this really matters for the practical application of how you get a, a successful blockchain to function. What we're looking at, though, at RMIT is what we're calling institutional crypto economics, which we, we which is very new. Um, uh, we've only sort of started working on this over the last six months or so. But we think this is a, a, a new way to look at this, the social, political, and economic consequences of blockchain technologies. So obviously, um, Bitcoin has some really significant political um, implications because of the way that it involves seceding from government-owned fiat currencies and so forth. But we think some of the um, political applications and economic applications of blockchains across the board in changing the nature of the firm, the nature of um, corporate relations, the nature of shareholder democracy, the nature of um, the way we interact in a contractual basis. And we think fundamentally even that the, the shape of our community and our, our relationships themselves when blockchain applications start to roll out, that's that's what we think institutional crypto economics can study. And, and so we think that's quite an exciting area. That does sound very exciting. <laughs> well, so, we think so, yeah. <laughs> so, what, so what is anarcho-capitalism? We hear that a lot in this space. And how does it relate to crypto economics? 
Look, that's a really interesting question, and it's a it's a really good question because the uh, Bitcoin, is, as as your listeners will know, came out of um, a, a semi political movement. So there are a lot of libertarians, particularly in early. Bitcoin, um, and they were very excited by the idea that Bitcoin allows you to secede from the state. No longer would you need to use government-owned fiat currencies. No longer would we be relying on central banks, the Federal Reserve or the Reserve Bank of Australia here in Australia. No, No longer would be doing that. We'd have this, not just a native internet currency, but an uncontrollable internet currency, a way that we could um, stay out of those sort of political institutions. So anarcho-capitalism, anarcho-capitalism is a variety of libertarian political um, philosophy, which which is about basically seceding from the state or at least reducing the state down to, to near nothingness and allowing people to voluntarily um, interact and, and make their own communities without, without the state and without the threat of um, state coercion. Anarcho-capitalism is, is, is very appealing if you're interested in, in blockchain and Bitcoin. What, what, I, what I, however, think it, we, we've moved a little away from that. We've moved away from the idea that blockchain applications just let us secede from the state. And we're more in an implementation phase where we're looking at not just non-state alternatives to state um, projects through blockchain, but the way existing institutions, the way, the way existing firms and existing government bureaucracies, bureaucracies can use blockchain in a way that ends up better for things that we care about, like individual liberty or even um, uh, if you come from the left of the political spectrum, equality and so forth. I think we're, we're now seeing not just this idea that we secede from the state, but the way that blockchain applications can allow us to do things and get benefits in a different way um, that, that we were unable to do technologically beforehand. Very cool. So what are some of the key factors that make crypto economics different from classical economics? Well, crypto economics is a, or what we call institutional crypto economics, is a, um, uh, a, a variety of um, institutional economics, which talks about rules and um, the way society coordinates. So um, uh, some of your listeners might be, might or might not be familiar with um, some of the basics of the history of economic thought. Um, you've got sort of two strands of economic thought. You've got um, what you call mainline or main, um, sorry, you, what you call mainstream economics, which is very much focused on sort of the, the economics 101, supply and demand. You've got um, uh, macroeconomics 101, which is focused on um, the relationship between inflation and unemployment and monetary economics and so forth. What institutional economics comes out of is is the sort of Hayekian spontaneous order, a tradition that derives from all the way back to Adam Smith, which talks about economics as a question about entrepreneurship. It's um, a, a it's a question uh, economics an economist should study innovators it should study the way people interact spontaneously the way people exchange and what we're trying to do is apply that tradition to the study of the blockchain economy we see the blockchain as not just a new technology but sort of a, a new institutional technology that allows us to run our own new economic ways of exchange. It's, it, the blockchain is its own economy. We can make new economies with blockchain. I think that's what's really very interesting about this technology. And that's what makes it more than just a new technology like the internet or, or electricity or, or, or coal or something like that. It's, it's a new way that we can create economies. And that's, that's what institutional crypto economics is studying. Interesting. Now, I, you know, anybody that's in this space knows that there's never a dull moment. There's never a boring moment in Bitcoin and, you know, cryptocurrency. So based on all the events that you've witnessed in the space, what's been the most shocking thing that you've observed that didn't really match what you thought would happen? Look, I initially expected that that Bitcoin itself would hold much more of a monopoly um, in the cryptocurrency space. I thought that um, uh, I'm a bit surprised that we've had, rather than evolutions in the underlying Bitcoin protocol, we've seen a um, split and division between lots of different cryptocurrencies. And 
we've been innovating on new cryptocurrencies rather than really doing some of the innovation on the Bitcoin platform itself. Now, I probably shouldn't have been surprised about that because Bitcoin's um, one of Bitcoin's selling points it's, it, is its stability. But I, I have been surprised that we haven't seen a, a sort of monopolization of, of cryptocurrencies. I think if you're interested in cryptocurrencies and you're not looking at some of the alternative ones, I, I think a lot of people still look at Bitcoin as the cryptocurrency to be interested in and the politics surrounding that. I, I think you're missing out on some of the real action. Yeah, that's true, because at last check, I think there were 1,100 or so crypto coins out there. But anyways, <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't recommend anybody invest in all of those, but um, yeah. uh, but, but there, are some, there are some really interesting and exciting ones. And, and the ones that I quite like are privacy coins, because I think the privacy coin issue is going to like be… Monero? Um, yeah, Monero, Zcash. Um, yeah. Those are the ones that I think are, are, are going to have the most political significance and i can see in a political economy sense that they'd be the most useful the most prospective in that sense yeah yeah you know the famous austrian economist uh frederick hayek you know predicted a future currency that would be democratic does this does bitcoin represent hayek's vision if yes why and if not what is bitcoin or the prevalent currencies missing to and what would it take them to make hayek's uh, ideal currency I think what we're lacking from Bitcoin is that evolutionary nature. I don't think Bitcoin, as I said, I don't think Bitcoin will be the be-all and end-all. Um, Hayek was talking about democratic currencies in, in a historical sense as well. And it's important to recognize that before the era of fiat currencies, we had a very um, uh, diverse and rich, in some countries at least, free banking system where banks themselves would issue currency um, that would be redeemable at those banks or other banks that are willing to um, recognize the validity of that currency. I think we might be moving back into that world where we've got a dynamic um, currency market. We've got um, more experimentation, uh, more evolution um, in in currencies, which which we've really forgotten um, for for a hundred years. Um, in Australia, um, which I've obviously studied the most, we got a fiat currency in 1911. We've had a fiat currency that long. This is the first cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin to start, but all the other cryptocurrencies are the first time that Australians have been able to use in Australia alternative currencies. That's that is revolutionary. Um, uh, but it is revolutionary in a historical setting. We, we may need to relearn some of the economics and some of the institutions that, that were prevalent in the 19th century again. Everything old is new again, as they say. So the miners in Bitcoin are viewed as mini dictators by many in the space, depending on what side you're on, of course. Uh, and based on Bitcoin's design, was this inevitable, do you think? And how can it be resolved? It's, it's obvious that Bitcoin is an experimental, was an experimental technology. It's now being used because of its popularity um, uh, by, by you know, a massive number of people. But it, is, it does have um, some fundamental flaws that I think we're now, now seeing, that the miners can um, uh, work as a class. It, that's not to say that you could have a miner with a with a fifty one percent stake, but the miners themselves are a political interest. They're a special interest in the Bitcoin ecosystem, and um, from an economic perspective or an analytical perspective, they should be they should be looked on that way. They have their interests, which may be different from the developers and may be different from the users themselves. This is not unusual in um, uh, in economic. Um, in economies, and obviously the history of the financial sector um, before Bitcoin was very, very, um, uh, very much structured around that. Bankers have interests, politicians have interests, and those might be quite different from the users of the currencies or lenders or um, borrowers or so forth. Uh, I, I think we need to understand how that works. What I am excited by, though, is the fact that we've got so many cryptocurrencies that those um, uh, they themselves act as a hedge against. Um, that sort of class-based monopolization. Chris, you know, we talked briefly that there are about 1,100 or so coins out there. But if you look at the real world, you know, there are about, what, 220 countries and territories. We're talking about 200 currencies. But the ones, the currencies that really matter, they're, you know, base currencies like the dollar, the pound, the euro, the yen. There are only about half a dozen. 
So looking at all the cryptocurrencies currently on the market, which one do you think will be a major source of store value and why? Or do you think it will be spread out into, I don't know, 100, 200 currencies? Uh, using cryptocurrencies as a store of value um, uh, is a bit premature. I don't think anybody would expect um, uh, certainly the market hasn't stabilized in a way that you could reliably use cryptocurrencies to store value long term. We've all got um, a bit of money in cryptocurrencies and we're all very excited to see um, uh, it, that money in increase when it does. But um, I don't think that it will be used as an economic store of value in a significant uh, you know, macroeconomic sense for a long time. I think the cryptocurrencies that are um, more likely to be used in that sense, down the track, are things like uh, things that have really obvious use cases, like Ethereum. I suspect will be a um, store of value if it works out as 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 we all hope that it will. If it um, can give us the applications that we hope that it will, um, I suspect that that um, Ethereum will be along those lines. But I I, I view this very much as an experiment. So. Um, we're, we're at such an early stage. There's no market in history that has developed in the space of less than a decade um, to this extent. And the, the market for cryptocurrencies in 10 years is going to look very, very different from it does now. I don't think we've really found the final the most powerful use case of cryptocurrencies. We haven't found what um, Bitcoin itself will be used for primarily yet. Um, I, I think we're in a very experimental stage. As I said before, I'm very excited by things like privacy coins because I can clearly see how they will fit into um, and revolutionize our existing political and economic system. But, but you know, it's, it's very hard to predict. I, I'm an economist, not a sort of philosopher. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's uh, interesting that you mentioned that we're still very, very early stage. So many of us that hold cryptocurrencies are really, you know, a very small minority, right? A very small sort of uh, uh, early, very early ado uh, adopters uh, of technology, I, in, uh, I would imagine. So if this is to be uh, adopted by the masses, what needs to take place? Like, what what is the space overlooking in order for cryptocurrencies to take to to be adopted by regular people? I think there are two things. Now, I don't think the um, uh, the community is really overlooking either of those. But the the first one is it, there needs to be a really obvious use case. So at the moment, there isn't a really obvious reason to hold Bitcoin apart from hoping to ride out. Um, uh, uh, price increases. So there's a speculative reason to hold some cryptocurrencies, and that's all very exciting, and we're all um, very excited to watch that. But until um, there's a more obvious use case than that, there's a more obvious reason for people to to hold this particular asset. I'm not sure um, that it's going to have widespread adoption. Now, it it, that, that may never come. They may always be a specialized, cryptocurrencies may always be a specialized asset. That won't make them any less valuable. It won't make them any less important. But we shouldn't expect mass adoption of a specialized asset in the same way that we don't expect everyone to hold shares in energy firms or, or hold shares in particular industries or hold hedge fund shares or, or something like that. Um, the other obvious reason that we haven't seen mass adoption yet is it, because it's incredibly hard to get in Involved in the first place, um, uh, the the first the setup costs for any individual to learn about um, cryptocurrencies and then to put money out of take money from fiat currency into the cryptocurrency world is is really significant. Um, it's very significant. It, it's very costly to look after your um, cryptocurrencies. It's very uh, costly to look after your keys. I don't mean costly in a financial sense. It just takes a lot of thinking. It takes a lot of learning. You need to spend a lot of time involving yourself. So it, it, even in the short time that we've had the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub, we've been talking to a lot of people who are interested in cryptocurrencies, but um, don't really understand them very well. Um, uh, and you've got to the community has to work on communicating what specifically is Bitcoin, what specifically is blockchain, why is it special in a way that people understand that it's not just, well, it's a distributed ledger that, that you know, mixes itself and turns into magic somehow. Um, I think a lot of people, when we talk about distributed ledger technology, they hear um, mumbo jumbo and magic. I think we've got to work harder on um, 
communicating specifically what blockchains are, what cryptocurrencies are, why they are special. And uh, until we are able to do that, uh, there isn't going to be mass adoption. Very good. You know, I can't help but recall uh, Martin, uh, uh, Felix Martin, who wrote, you know, Money, the Unauthorized Biography. He had a chapter about, uh, you know, the uh, bankers, the merchant bankers of Leon in about, I think it was 15, 55 or something like that. And where they basically bypassed the entire sovereign uh, issuance of the state by issuing their own ledgers and maintaining their own ledgers. I think Bitcoin sort of represents something like that. In in your opinion, how close are we in replacing the government's monopoly on issuing money today? Well, look, we, we've already broken their monopoly. So um, the concept of cryptocurrencies, the idea and the implementation even already has, has broken that monopoly. That's, that is a really exciting thing. If you want to store um, uh, money, actual currency, outside the... Um, uh, political economic system of the country in which you reside, you can put it in cryptocurrencies. That That's quite significant. And I think the um, governments around the world, certainly law enforcement agencies around the world, are keenly aware that that monopoly has been has been broken. Um, but of course, the government still dominates and governments still dominate the, the market for currency. Um, until we find cryptocurrencies with a really obvious use case until we work on until we fix usability issues we're not going to um, beat their dominance it is still much easier to work with your bank so um, uh, to, to use a ATM card um, uh, in Australia and I know lots around lots of countries around the world um, just simple tapping your card that is really trivially easy and I don't think we're anywhere near cryptocurrencies. Um, uh, uh, replacing that anytime soon. Okay. And in terms of, I mean, this is, I guess, a great segue into the next question. Uh, If a large portion of the population does decide that they want to transition to cryptocurrencies, what advice would you specifically give to bankers and government bureaucrats to prepare them for this transition? This is an interesting question because because we we are giving that sort of advice at the moment. I think every government around the world is trying to um, uh, come to terms with what it means to have cryptocurrencies in its in its economy. How do you how do you tax them? How do you treat a um, initial coin offering? Should that be treated as an IPO, initial public offering, or should be treated something different? Now we, we have a slightly contrarian um, uh, view on this. We actually think that we should be trying to. Imp- integrate cryptocurrencies into the existing regulatory frameworks as much as possible. So to take the ICO example, we're, we're seeing a lot of um, uh, rather cowboy style activity in the ICO space. A lot of that is going to um, go belly up. It'll go belly up eventually, if not soon. Um, and people are going to lose money. Now, if the community has spent the last couple of years um, uh, trying to claim that ICOs are just totally different from anything that's been seen in the economy before, if it's this totally new experimental beast, then the regulation that comes down after that inevitable um, uh, after that inevitable crash is going to be very very onerous. It's going to be new regulation. It's going to be um, very challenging regulation. It's going to be regulation to, I suspect, to to almost eliminate the ICO industry or the ICO technique of raising funds. If, if, however, we point out that an ICO is just a different sort of security, it's what we expect um, uh, to see. It's an experimental form of um, an existing uh, economic institution, then the regulation that's going to be imposed on new cryptocurrencies and new fundraising is going to be onerous, but it's not going to be um, reckless, it's not going to be new, it's not going to be dangerous to the sector as a whole. I, I think we should be trying to integrate many of these new ideas into as many of the existing institutions as possible. That's not very popular in the cryptocurrency community by any means, um, uh, because it's um, because of that anarcho-capitalist ethic that we still have, um, that we believe that we should be trying to secede from the state, that these things shouldn't be taxed or regulated or anything, but they will be taxed and they will be regulated. Um, uh, the the more prominent they get, the more media they get. There's there's going to be government intervention coming down the line. We need to be managing the risks of that government intervention and in now, rather than when the first real um, uh, crisis occurs. 
So Chris, I have two questions. The first one is, you know, a lot of prominent people in the financial services space have said this is nothing more than a bubble. They specifically talk about Bitcoin. Do you, uh, I mean, bubble or not, but if it were to burst, if it were to burst like, you know, the way they are predicting, do you think we will, uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies will remain or will it be the end of it? That's my first question. I, I have quite a bit of faith in the underlying technology. I think we've seen, even even in um, hypothetical Im- implementations and applications, I think we've seen that the underlying technology of blockchain is actually something different. It's quite significant. Um, it has economic characteristics that no other institution in society can provide. Um, the idea of having a um, a, a trustless ledger, a, um, a network that doesn't rely on a central um, authority, I think is a really powerful um, economic attribute provided by the blockchain. So even if Bitcoin crashes, even if um, we're in the middle of a, an enormous bubble, even if, um, even if every blockchain firm that's doing well now suddenly goes under, I think the underlying technology blockchain will continue to have um, uh, significance and there will continue to be really powerful and important applications of it. Um, it's uh, it's impossible to identify a bubble when you're in one. If we knew that we were in a bubble, then, every, then the bubble would immediately burst. Bubbles are only evident in retrospect. And, and if that's the case, it's sometimes not even clear that there is any such thing as a bubble. There's just new information. I, I, I don't get too excited about that. I wouldn't put my life savings in cryptocurrencies, but, um, but, but any market activity that we're seeing, even if it seems... Um, uh, overexcited, I don't think, affects the underlying blockchain technology that is very powerful. Yeah, but you are an exception. You are an economist, right? So, you know, you're not really mainstream, right? So the mainstream <laughs> just does, does very irrational things. But another question is, you know, uh, in the previous financial crisis, uh, which was in 2007, 2008, the cryptocurrency had not yet been a variable, had not yet been invented. There was no way you could park your money disassociated by the state. You should fiat money and, you know, park it anywhere. Uh, yeah, you could do that with gold, but you had to go buy gold. In the next financial crisis, whenever that happens, how much of a role do you think cryptocurrencies will play when people will start parking their wealth, you know, their assets, be it temporarily, into cryptocurrencies? That's a really good question. I, I, uh, of course, it wasn't just that um, uh, cryptocurrencies didn't exist at the last global financial crisis. They were released basically at the start or, um, or halfway through the start, I should say. Um, November 2008 was a very interesting time to release a um, currency that is completely separate from the state. Um, and in that sense, I think it's going to have a really significant impact anytime the the financial system is under strain. Um, we, we can talk about one of the most obvious use cases for cryptocurrencies, and that's in countries that don't have stable political or economic environments. It's a very good place to park money, or at least it's a very good way to transfer money like out of that. Venezuela? Like, like Venezuela, like um, uh, Zimbabwe. Or even China, Zimbabwe, but even a country like China. I mean, there's a, there are... Um, uh, there are obvious geopolitical reasons that what we're seeing in China is happening at the moment. Um, and and that that is a really obvious use case in countries that already have problematic financial institutions. If we find that um, uh, we're going to go through another financial crisis, I think um, even if cryptocurrencies are just used as a tool to shift money around quickly, they, they will be a big factor in that in the way we respond to the crisis. I don't think they'll be uh, to blame for the crisis or anything like that, but I do think they will be a big part of the mixture of how we manage that crisis how, as individuals and as a society. Yeah, but I mean, the, w- the way I look at it is like an equation, right? So you have this equation pre-2000 or circa 2007, which just didn't have this variable called cryptocurrency. And, you know, physicists and economists and people, and everyone was just okay with this equation. And suddenly cryptocurrency came in. It's like discovering the speed of light, right? Or gravity <laughs> or something. And then how does it really change economics? I mean, right now, when you're looking at it, is it rewriting economics? Is it time to rewrite some of the basic fundamentals of tax collection and supply and demand and, you know, the 
the very basic elements or character characteristics of currency or is it just you know uh just just another f- you know f- passing thing and we'll be okay with it how, yeah, how, just how is it yeah. how, but how is it affecting economics on the whole Okay, so I think there are two parts to that. If we had a financial crisis tomorrow, um, cryptocurrencies will be one of the tools that are used by the actors involved. Um, it, that's largely, however, because um, the blockchain itself and cryptocurrencies specifically haven't really been integrated that deeply into the financial system. Now, if they are integrated to the financial system in a way that I suspect they will be, so um, financial institutions starting to use um, blockchains and um, publicly audible blockchain, auditable blockchains um, for their internal and external financial relationships, then I think that's going to really significantly change the way a crisis occurs. So um, with the big problem, or one of the big problems in the global financial crisis was that banks didn't know whether the parties they were dealing with were solvent. There was huge counterparty risk. Now, if you put all the a bank's operation on some sort of blockchain application, then counterparty risk disappears. They are immediately and instantaneously auditable. You will know if you're if the bank or financial organization you were dealing with is solvent. That that is a huge transformation. We are eliminating at least one major potential market failure that we know has real world consequences. Uh, as an economist, I look at um, the list of market failures and uh, the enormous ways that markets can fail to be as efficient as possible. Um, and a lot of those come from a lack of information, what we call information asymmetries, which is that one person interacting in a marketplace doesn't know the information held by the person they would like to trade with or exchange with. And blockchains and blockchain applications can substantially eliminate some of those market failures. This will, this, uh, in my view, this completely eliminates, for example, the market for lemons. So the idea that you don't know whether a product you are buying is a, is a lemon, is a, um, is a dud product. If you have blockchain applications, you can actually audit the history of that product. You can audit um, uh, the, the provenance of it, where it came from, where it was um, built. Uh, in Australia, of course, we have a huge agricultural sector and um, the agricultural sector in Australia is really excited about blockchain for agricultural provenance. So to demonstrate, yes, this the cattle that we're shipping to, to the Middle East or to Asia is actually high quality um, uh, high quality cattle. You know that it was. Um, uh, you, you know exactly where it came from, and uh, in say South Australia, in a um, cattle range in South Australia, and you can demonstrate to potential buyers half the way half the way around the world reliably that that it came from where you say it came from. I think those sorts of applications and those sorts of changes are where we're going to see the most exciting blockchain applications and blockchain technologies. It's not really cryptocurrencies. It's not really Bitcoin. It's it's one by one eliminating some of the most powerful market failures that have dogged market transactions since we 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 first made trades. Hmm. And as an economist, I mean, now that you know pretty much everything there is to know, uh, like everyone else about the distributed ledger technology in the blockchain and cryptocurrency, within this space, what excites you the most? As I've said, I, th- I think the privacy coins are the most exciting. Um, but uh, an- another why? area... Uh, Give me an uh, example why. Yeah, so privacy coins actually finally get you out of um, uh, state control. So that that's really very exciting if you're in a state that you don't trust. Um, so that's very exciting if you are um, trying to protect wealth as you personally move across borders or you're trying to pass... Um, wealth back to people who who live in states that they can't trust. I think that that is a that is I, I think a very significant deal. It has some really significant real world consequences that we're going to um, uh, be handling for a long time. Because of course, while good guys are protected by privacy coins, bad guys can be protected by privacy coins as well. I think the other major application and major implementation um, that I'm excited by is is I, the combination of identity uses of the blockchain and privacy uses of the blockchain at the same time. So in Australia, and I know in many countries around the world, we have constant scandals about the use of, um, uh, about data exploitation, particularly not, not, not just um, uh, like in the Equifax case by a corporation, 
Um, but I- I- even our healthcare system, we get constant violations of privacy. People were selling Medicare card numbers and details on the um, on the dark web quite recently, and that was a major scandal in Australia. We see um, police officers looking up police databases um, to identify people who are under um, uh, under inter- anti violence intervention orders. This sort of thing. If you can have new approaches to managing identity on a blockchain that adequately protects people's privacy from those who have no right to look at it. This could be revolutionary. This is changing the relationship between citizen and the state, changing the relationship between people and their own uh, and information about themselves. That, that, that could be really significant. That's a big part of our research project, looking at blockchain applications for identity. And um, uh, and that's going to be a big part of the interaction with the community and government at the moment, because we need to convince governments to um, start handing over or ha- ceding control of some of the masses of data they keep about us. Hmm. You know, Alex and Don Tapscott, they had the book on the blockchain, and they mentioned that after the joint stock registrar company, the double entry accounting system, the blockchain technology has is probably going to be the most revolutionary thing out there. Do you agree or disagree with that? Yeah, I actually do agree with that. I think um, viewing the world through, uh, viewing the history of the world or the history of economics through development of ledgers, so um, double entry bookkeeping being um, uh, one of the most famous, but uh, it, it actually gives you a new window on on economics, on um, the nature of uh, economic relations, the nature of um, of markets, and so forth. And I think uh, uh, looking at blockchain in that history is quite revealing. So the first ledger technology wasn't double entry bookkeeping; it was writing. The first um, uses of writing in in um, the ancient Near East were to to mark down ledgers about information that people had. You know, I have um, seven cows and um, six sheep. You you want to write that down. You want to, and once you've written that down, you're able to you're able to trade that information as well. So you can tell people that I've got cows for you to buy, and or I've got cows um, to sell, or, or you're able to. Um, uh, just you know, exchange the cows. You subtract one cow from one ledger, and you add one cow to another ledger. This the uh, ledgers themselves made trade possible. They made exchange possible. They made economies possible. So if we see ledgers at the center of um, uh, of, of economic exchange, then you know, history of writing is the first one, and then double entry bookkeeping allows more auditable. Um, ledgers. You can actually trace uh, relationships between multiple ledgers, and then we get the history, uh, the start of databases for, um, with the start of computing, and now we've got decentralized databases and decentralized networks. I think I, 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 I don't think that's hyperbole at all. I think that's that is why I'm more excited about blockchain than I am about individual cryptocurrencies because Bitcoin may come and go, um, Ethereum may come and go, but the idea of a um, decentralized distributed digital ledger is is here with us to stay. Do you have your fellow peers within the economist uh, circle who sort of just, you know, with a wave of the hand say, ah, garbage, you know, this is all BS. <laughs> or, 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 I mean, do you have naysayers? Um, uh, you don't necessarily have naysayers. What you do have is um, uh, uncertainty that um, that this technology could be as powerful as you say it is. And I really think a big part of that is because it takes a lot of time to understand what a blockchain is. I think you we've all heard various um, two sentence explanations of what a blockchain is or what cryptocurrencies are. It's a decentralized ledger. It's five complementary technologies, append-only databases, and, and um, uh, public key cryptography and so forth. But but those explanations never really make people that comfortable, or they never get people at a stage that they feel comfortable in explaining it to others, and they never understand why it works in the way it does. Our challenge talking to fellow economists and talking to fellow scholars has been simply to explain what the underlying technology is. Only then can we start explaining um, uh, why we think it's so exciting. That, that, that's quite costly. That takes time. I've got one last question. 
And well, maybe it's not the last. I don't know if you've got any other questions, Faisal. But um, my question is, is there a flip side to the excitement? Uh, Is there anything that scares you about the blockchain and the power of it, particularly if it's in the wrong hands? I don't think I'm scared by the blockchain, but there are some very clear downsides and there are going to be some really significant um, uh, political and economic consequences that we're going to have to deal with. Um, The blockchain, uh, because of its sort of born global nature, it means that we're going to have more of what you call a superstar effect in um, modern economies or blockchain connected economies. So um, uh, there are going to be people who thrive in a world where you can trade instantaneously with um, uh, another person across the world where Australian and a German can get together and um, uh, build a decentralized firm. Um, but there are going to people. There are going to be people who lose out in that world. There are going to be a um, a group of people who are unable to compete against the the, the best German and the best Australian working together um, to create a new firm. There's going to be some really significant changes there. There are also going to be some losers. There are going to be some. Um, losers that are currently um, very successful under the existing institutional um, setup. So uh, large financial institutions are going to look very different and, and may um, function very differently in, their, uh, in a blockchain world, and they are going to push back against this sort of stuff. Other large firms that rely primarily on financial capital are going to um, suffer in a world where human capital becomes more Valuable. We're going to see some really significant economic disruption, and as we know, economic disruption often leads to political disruption um, uh, a, a, as it goes through. So I, I think there are. I'm not scared, but I think we are entering a new disruptive world. We talk about disruption a lot in 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 politics. We um, talk about innovation and the importance in Australia. We we talk about the importance of being agile and and all that sort of thing. But but I think now that we've got blockchain technology we we can really start to see what is going to happen and it's going to be it, it, it it's going to be very busy for a few years you know there was this internet of value that we talk about everyone saying this is now the internet of value do you see it you know i mean the internet was supposed to be the great equalizer right every country could be competing with each other and they can in many ways do you see the internet of value with also being an equalizer where emerging or developing markets can sun- somehow suddenly compete on a global scale does it, it does. does it give does it give a small country an advantage uh, or a disadvantaged country you know i i actually think the smaller countries have a opportunity that they might not expect at the moment so the technologies or the blockchain implementations I'm most excited by are the ones that come really crashing into existing government and regulatory frameworks. Um, So the winners in that world are the countries that are able to adapt their regulatory institutions, adapt their bureaucracies to suit this new world. The first countries that put property titling on blockchains are going to um, uh, are going to prosper now those tend to be smaller countries in fact smaller countries tend to be more agile we're very used to certainly in Australia we're very used to complaining that we haven't got a great Silicon Valley like the United States we we really need to have our where, where is our own Google why aren't we why aren't we building the iPhone in Australia um, but the United States is developing a lot of these technologies I I'm not sure how they're going to be able to implement them because it's about the agility of your political and regulatory system as much as it is about your capacity to um, uh, create the new technologies. Um, and, and that's where, that certainly that's what we're saying to the Australian government. This is an opportunity that we may not have expected. If we're quick off the market changing the way we do things, then the technologies uh, may be invented elsewhere. I mean, Australia has a pretty thriving blockchain um, community. But even if the technologies are all invented overseas, we can be quick off the mark in implementing them. We can be quick off the mark in using them to change what we do. That's something that um, uh, applies to lots of small countries uh, around the world. And I think that's why we're seeing uh, uh, you know, conversations um, about blockchain implementation in like Estonia, 
um, uh, in in Israel and in, in lots of um, lots of perhaps smaller countries rather than the the really large ones whose regulatory and political systems may not be that quick to adapt. Very good, very good. So, Chris, this has been an illuminating conversation. Is there a, a way, if anyone would like to interact with you, communicate with you, what's the best way of reaching you? Uh, look, so I'm easy to Google, just Chris Berg, or I've got a re- website, chrisberg.org. Otherwise, my colleagues and I have a, um, a website where we put all our research, which is um, cryptoeconomics.com.au. Um, so all one word, cryptoeconomics, and then .com.au. So um, uh, I, I hope that, uh, uh, that, that they find that useful and, and interesting material there. Well, thank you for sharing that, Nako. Yes, lovely. It was lovely having you. We learned a lot, Christopher, and hopefully you can come back and, and uh, you know, get, let us know how things are going at your lab. It would be my pleasure. Very good, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.